Hi, I'm Kai Savas. Uh, welcome to another All Access interview here. I'm uh, sitting with uh, composer Gustavo Santoalaja. Gustavo, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. How are you? Thank you, Kai. I'm very good, very good. First of all, we want to dive in. I do want to congratulate you uh, for this amazing honor that you have from ASCAP. Uh, com composer's thank you choice. So much. I'm very happy. I'm very, very happy about yes. that award. It's an award that is given by other composers. Yes. You know, it's voted a, so by your peers. It means a lot to me. It means a lot. To have best video game of the uh, best video game score of the year, composer's choice at the 2021 uh, ASCAP Screen Music Awards. So congratulations on that. Uh, I would love to start. Uh, uh, I know you've told the story on other interviews about how you know were given a guitar when you were five years old, and you kind of right. had, uh, you know uh, the the early days where you kind of got into music. But what what was the point right. of your life where you thought, okay, this is my career. This is what's going to be what I'm going to do for a living. Do you remember that moment, or did it happen gradually? No, I mean I. Uh... I mean, I, I, I remember, I mean, when I still had, you know, short, wearing short pants <laughs> and uh, saying at a, at a family gathering or something that I wanted to be like Paul Anka, I think I mentioned, because I mean, you know, I, I, or some, like an artist like that. That was like, like the first thing. I knew that I wanted to be there, but when really, 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 uh, I, I, I knew it and I felt it was when, when the Beatles came in. Uh, to to the light. So I I you know I I started playing guitar when I was five. My my teacher quit on me when I was ten. That's when I started writing little things. My first group was a folk group, an Argentinian folk group. At that time, uh, in the sixties, uh, Argentinian folk music became very popular. Uh, it, it it kind of got to uh to become almost pop you know not not uh, not in the not in the musical design but in the fact that it became uh, extremely popular and uh, there was a, a, pro a program on tv that was uh, sponsored by crush by the the, the it was crush for us <laughs> is orange beverage and they had every uh, weekend they had this program where they have like new talents come and compete and stuff and there was a, a proliferation of of uh, Argentinian folkloric music and so I, I, I when I was 10 uh, in between 10 and 11 I, I had this this group was a trio it was uh, two guitars and bombo uh, and uh, but when I but I always love uh, rock and roll I, you know I, I started with more like old stuff what my parents used to here I grew up the listening to all sorts of music one of the things that I really uh, uh, love about you know how was my, my 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 growing up was the fact that at home we listened to all kinds of music and then my parents were avid record buyers I mean I see other friends of mine that you know the parents didn't have that many records my 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 parents always were buying records uh, and uh, so you know I went through you know from tango and uh, you know Argentina folk music to classical music to uh, to American music, a lot of you know, I mean, uh, Les Paul and Mary Ford, uh, Dinah Shore, uh, um, you know, really a wide variety. You know, uh, Frankie Lane, for example. You know, I'm talking about Bing Crosby, you know, Sinatra, all that stuff. Uh, and uh, so <clears throat> it was a really common until you know, uh, Bill Haley came. I love that. I remember the first rock and roll record that my parents bought was Rock Around the Clock, you know, but, but and really that sort of changed the whole thing. And I wanted an electric guitar that moment. So I got my first electric guitar when I was uh, 12. And around that time to between 12 or 13. And uh, the first records, the first albums that I bought were, it's funny because I, I kind of saved some money from little errands that I did for my parents and stuff. And I bought two albums, G.I. Blues by Presley, which was already like a more tamed Presley. He was in the military service then and stuff. And the first album by Los Teen Tops. Los Teen Tops were this Mexican band that actually sang rock in Espanol. You know, years later, oh, ages yeah. later, I found in a book of record covers, I found the record cover of Los Teen Tops, but the American edition and actually had on the top written big rock in Espanol, which was a term that was used many, many years after, you know, but I think really th that was the first time that probably happened, you know? So 
you know, the Steam Tops used to sing like, you know, Chuck Berry songs or, you know, or uh, Fats Domino songs, but, uh, um, but uh, translated to, or Lieber Stoller uh, translated to, uh, to Spanish, but it was Mexican slang. And it was the first time that I could articulate, you know, rock and roll with Spanish. And uh, so I, that's, I wanted the electric guitar. So I got that electric guitar when I was 11, I think, you know, between 10 and 11. And by the time I was between 12 and 13, that's when the Beatles came to the scene. And it was over. I mean, that's over. Was, yeah. <laughs> I knew that that was what I wanted to do. And uh, I, I was always a very good student in school. So, you know, I never, you know, had to take, you know, extra exams or, you know, never flunk. I mean, I was always in the first two or three of the class, always. I was, but I wasn't like a nerd, you know, but I just was just good. I enjoy school. I love, I, I like to, 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 to learn and, and, uh, and I grew up a, be, being very disciplined you know my 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 mother was very strict you know with me and uh in a good sense i think you know yeah that's great structure it, for it, sure. in a good sense but uh but uh, so so uh that's when i when when i put the band together that then was the seed that then became arcoiris and uh, my my father used to work in advertising it's funny he worked for a for a big advertising company that is huge even today in the world, it's J.W. Thompson, you know, Walter Thompson. Mm, and yeah. um, and uh, so he got me the opportunity to, to record some demos. Like I record one demo when I was uh, 13, another when I was 14, and another one when I was 15. And of course you record those demos and they give you a, an acetato, an acetate, you know? Mm-hmm. And that was, that's what I had, I still have those. It's amazing. And, uh, <laughs> those were my, my 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 first songs and stuff. And then I switch after the third is when I really made the switch from writing in English because that was like the thing there. And I went to a an English British uh, elementary school so I could handle you know some English. I could write, even write in English a little bit. But then I switched to write in Spanish. And then you know and then that that seed became Arcoiris. And that's the band actually that then the first uh, band that I that I was that became really popular and became big. There's a series on Netflix that I recommend to you uh, that I'm I'm uh, one of the narrators and the executive producer. It's called Break It All, Break and it it's all? the story yeah. of of rock and español uh, against the background of the social political reality that we were living. And yes. during all these decades, you know, and it's uh, it, it's 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 very informative, but it's very entertaining, and you really got the feeling of the context. You know, David Byrne has said that the the future of of of, of the rock is not in England or in the United States, but it's in the third world. And I would like to add that I think Latin America is at the forefront of that, and it's really it, it's a big part of my life. That's where I come from musically you know right right it's know. everything your identity it's everything exactly it comes from there so it's it's if i mean if you want to know a little more at least you know the first two episodes you can watch the series is in netflix it's been uh, shown in 190 territories it's been subtitled in 30 languages and it was top 10 number one uh, for a uh, couple of weeks in argentina and mexico top 10 for a month in latin america and it got to number 15 in netflix worldwide chart so it was wow. it's been very very successful just came out uh, last year at uh, uh, at the end at the end of the year i'm definitely uh, gonna check that out yeah i need to check so that out. so i think i think you'll enjoy i think you'll have fun yeah. watching it <laughs> yeah. so that's that's where i that's where I, I come from i started making records i signed my first uh deal my first professional deal when i was 16 with uh, rca i i wanted to um talk about kind of how you kind of entered into the film music world, of course, uh, okay. working with the amazing Alejandro Gonzalez right. and Yuritu. Right. Um, and we could spend hours breaking that down from, you know, Morris Perros and Babel and, and Beautiful, yeah, which is, yeah. I think, very that, underrated. That, that's what led me to Walter Salles and, and so forth, so forth, so forth. I mean, it's very, it's very simple. I can, I can, I, I will try to, to, to resume some things because that connect with that. Yeah, I yeah. always was very interested in cinema, very interested. As a matter of fact, when I, my plan was that to finish high school and to go and study filmmaking. 
Uh, that didn't, I mean, the, the whole thing, I mean, in my, my family started to deteriorate. I mean, my parents have been so supportive all my life of, of my, the music and, you know, bought me instruments and, you know, amplifier and everything, very supportive always. But the moment that I decided that I wanted to, that that was what I wanted to do in my life, things got a little bit, you know, hairy because they, yeah. they thought that we, being such a good student and stuff, you know, that, you know, that probably, you know. And so in any case, eh, when I finished high school, unfortunately, one of the, the several military governments that we had that actually, you know, end up with a life of 30,000 people in my country eh, closed the Institute of Cinematography because they thought it was a focus of communists or whatever, yeah, you know, right, right. That I didn't have any more uh, school. So I wanted to study a little bit of television, but that was my stint with, with, with film. But I always was very interested in film. And one thing that I always got a comment that I always got from people was that my music was very visual. Everybody will tell me, oh, my, your music is so visual. My productions, you know, I mean, I, you know, I have produced more than 100 albums of other artists. And, uh, uh, you know, your albums, you know, they're so visual. I always had this, and I think music in visual terms. So in a way, I found it very organic for me to, to go into this. There's an album by Arcoiris that I did when I was 18 years old. It's, it's called just Arcoiris. It has a, a pink cover with a symbol in it. And that album, which has been re-released now in vinyl and stuff, you know, uh, it's really like the blueprint you'll find there my my scores my every everything is in that that record in a long genesis of your sound yeah. instrumental passages you know right uh, so i always was attracted to uh, to movies so when when the possibility of doing amores perros came you know i i have done prior to that just one movie a very interesting movie called she dances alone very hard to find Federico de Laurentiis, Dino's son, was the producer, actually. Oh, wow. And then yeah. died in an accident, and then kind of like that movie went. Well. And right. it's a movie about Nijinsky, uh, but it's a really interesting movie. It's directed by a guy named Robert Dornhelm. It's from Austria. He was nominated for an Oscar for a, a documentary, but also then he went on to, he directed a film called Echo Park with Tom Waits and some, you know, and I think I lost totally track of Robert, but I believe he's continues directing uh, t uh, shows for TV, TV series and stuff, right? But we did them where that movie was really interesting because it was a movie about Nijinsky, but uh, uh, with Nijinsky's daughter in the movie, which is a, was at the time a very much past by now, but uh, she was an old lady and she had mental problems. So the movie was about a director trying to make a movie about Nijinsky. It was very confused. Sometimes Kira will talk to Bud Court, was the, the director. So she will talk to Bud Court sometimes, and sometimes she will lose it and will talk to actually to Robert. <laughs> Do you see that? She switched to talk to the, the other director, you know, the real director. And uh, Max von right. Sydow did like the voiceover. I mean, it's really interesting movie. So that was my first experience of doing a uh, score. And it didn't go anywhere more than that. I always had my bands producing that. But then suddenly this opportunity came of, of Amores Perros. And I remember that I was very busy at the time. I'm always multitask. I'm doing very several projects at the same time. Uh, and uh, I was so busy, so busy, so busy. I never, I didn't read the script. I didn't uh, 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 saw a rough cut or anything. And I remember I told Lucia, my my assi old life assistant, I said, Lucia, I know, just call tomorrow and say that I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this movie. Let's be realistic. I haven't read a script. I never seen anything by this director. It's his first movie. I, we are covered by 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 work. I mean, you know, it's just you know. And in the middle of the night, I woke up. This is absolutely a real story. And I started to think, what if, what if, what if this movie is amazing? What if the director is, you know, some, you know some great and stuff? And I'm just saying no to something that I didn't even. So I called early. Lucia said, just stop. You know, just tell them that if they come over and they show me the movie, I will consider. And sure enough, Alejandro came. At the time, you know, we were VHS. So he came and we put the VHS 
in and uh, he went out. He was chain smoking. He went out. And after the first 10 minutes, remember Amore Perros, that car chase and stuff. Yes. I yes. look at my, you know, I've been working with this with Aníbal. He's an engineer and, and co-producer for more, more than 35 years. We've been working together. And we look at each other. And go, Man, we're doing this movie. You know, we're, <laughs> that's how we got into... Amores Perros, okay? Yeah, yeah. Which was also a movie that already had a temp track. So I really, I mean, I put my 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 trademark there, my wrong note there, you know, my 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 dissonant stuff. Uh, but 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 it was, you know, there was already something there. But uh, I'm I'm telling you this because that's not the way that I usually work. And then Alejandro at certain point said, you know, there's this friend of mine, you know. Walter Salles, that is, as I always say, yeah, Central Station. I love uh, Central Station. Walter Salles, he's doing this movie about Guevara, you know, and you know, you're from Argentina. You should talk to him, and that's how I talked to uh, to Walter, and I did the Motorcycle Diaries. Yes, and Motorcycle, motorcycle Diaries. Uh, it was uh, it was the first movie that got really uh, recognition, international recognition. But when we were presenting the movie in Sundance, looking for distribution here in the States. That same evening, you know, the movie was shown, the distribution was, was arranged and at a party at a house, somebody starts saying, you know, Gustavo should meet Ang Lee because, uh, you know, he's doing this, and Gustavo should meet with him. And, you know, they sent me a script from Broadway. I loved it. And like two months later, I was in New York uh, playing with a friend of mine in Carnegie Hall, and uh, and I got this phone call and said, you know, Angus at at the office is in, in focus, and he would like to meet you. And I had my Ron Rocco with me, so I took the subway. I went, you know, I remember, and 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 you know, like Chinese man, not talk at all, just was like, hi, hi. He's a very he timid guy. Yeah. yeah, he pointed at the at my the case, you know. Right. So I took out the Ron Rocco and just start playing. Just like that, without without really saying more than hi hi, and I just do the on rock and start playing, and that kind of like set up the mood for the for the, <laughs> the the meeting. And then we talk about the ideas of the guitar and you know the strings and that, right? So I came back to Los Angeles, started working, and 15 days later, you know, I had I had the score, I had the score, the whole wow. score. 15 days. I send it to him. I send it to him. This is real funny. And I call back. You know, like a few days later, I talked to James Seamus and he was laughing and he said, you don't know what happened. Oh, I said, no, tell me. Well, Ang got the tape and he thought that this was something that you were sending him to show what you stuff that you have done. And he said, damn it. I mean, this will be perfect. This music for the movie, you know, I said, no, <laughs> this is the and he told me then he said, I'll see you at the Oscars. He told me, I remember I was in Miami at the time. I was wow. on the beach coming with my wife at the beach and he said i'll see you at the oscars what the, really and then <laughs> uh, i remember i mean also going back to motorcycle diaries that it was the first time that i got it recognition i was saying because uh, i was nominated for a bafta you know and uh and i i wasn't gonna go i mean it was nominated against howard shore and i don't know if Hans Zimmer was i don't know but there were these huge guys there it's i don't have the slight chance there you know and the people in London, you know, calling me, listen, come, <laughs> come here because the movie was, people love here the movie and they love the music and you should, you know, and we said, well, okay, let's go, you know, I mean, it's a trip to London, let's, let's, and so we went, I remember we were coming in the theater and they were playing the music of Motorcycle Diaries. I went, oh, oh, <laughs> it can happen. And it did, it won best uh, foreign movie but, and it won the score, you know, and that, so that was the first, like, ah, boom, you know. Yeah, just a big shock. Yeah, and then the next year was uh, uh, the next year was uh, was uh, uh, broke back. Uh, I was nominated again for the for the BAFTA, but this time I, I didn't uh, uh, win. And uh, then the third year was the BAFTA again nominated, and I won the BAFTA and the second Oscar with Babel. Yeah, I mean, those are all fantastic. I mean, those string of, I mean, it all happened so quick and it just, yes, just, very quick. And, and yeah. no, no, uh, no Hollywood agent. No, I mean, I work with Robert Messenger, which I love. Okay. But it's not, right. it wasn't, none of this that I'm telling you was the fruit of, you know, 
any logistics or you know deals and things yeah after because i was you know very successful and i am very successful uh, producer of latin alternative music that's why yeah then you know so i had now have 19 grammys you know i mean i have 17 latin grammys and two anglo grammys i was nominated for an anglo grammy right now with uh, a bajo fondo too Uh, so that was my like my world you know so i i never but the connection with the movies in a way have always been there in the music itself the the visual element you know yes 100 percent and and the fact that that led to Neil Druckmann reaching out to you, um, I mean, that's such a fantastic story. Well, to- in this, yeah, in this period, after those movies and this recognition and stuff, mm-hmm. I was approached by a couple of companies to do video, a video game. Mm. One, a big French company, one of the big ones, you know? Right. But I never connected. I didn't, I always, mm. I mean, I always, that sense, you know, I'm very picky. Uh, what I do, and I always do stuff. Even they can be could be very small stuff, you know. I rather do a small movie, you know, in India or in or in France or something that to do, you know, some Hollywood movie that I really don't like, you know, or whatever. Even if they pay more money, it just was never about the money for me. Never, you know. So right, right. I'm always trying to do stuff that reverberate uh, with me. And uh, so I, I knew because I, I'm not a gamer, but my son is or was at the time, you know, it's been nine years in the first game, you know, since we started working on the first game. Uh, so he was, and I always like, like to watch, you know, how he played, you know, and I always thought, you know, if somebody makes really a, an emotional connection, the day that somebody creates really an emotional connection with a player, this is going to be a game changer no 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 pun intended but this this is going to change the the whole thing you know and so when i met neil i always compare neil i always said that it's like a it's it's obviously it's another person different but remind me a little bit of alejandro in in a in 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 his way not in his way of thinking certain things you know the drama and the pathos you know yes he's all about the emotion the characters yeah Yeah, exactly and uh, so I, I I went right for it. I knew this this was a game that I wanted to be involved with. You know, I'm so glad that I didn't do the other ones. So glad. Yeah, yeah. Glad I'm glad too. Because <laughs> that that I'm when the, I remember playing that first game. I'm a gamer. I mean, I I and I first Last of Us two I loved as well. And um, just the because of course Uncharted had already kind of become a thing, and Naughty Dog kind of was growing as you yeah, know really right. this kind of storytelling studio. And of course Neil taking Last of Us. I remember starting that game and I remember that the first prologue, the the opening, we know when he loses his daughter and you're just crying and you're and tears are coming down your face. And then that opening credits start and then your theme hits. And I wanted to ask you because that that theme, I'm a huge Western fan and I, I definitely picked yes. up elements of the Western genre. Of course, and of course then... because I love that. I love that too. I love I'm a I'm a I'm a big fan of uh, Americana. But you know, I, I I sort of interpret it in my own way. I many yes. times you know, I think about it. You know, uh, well, there's something about that, uh, and an anecdote that is it's a, it's a, I think it, it it will enrich this. Uh, um, when I came to this country in 1978, um, I uh, I came with you know with songs and some music that I wanted to 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 distribute to show. Me. So I, I distributed cassettes, different people and stuff and I got good response from no one you know but only one guy <laughs> one guy got a response he used to work at Island Publishing mm. you know uh, and uh, so you know I got a meeting with him you know he had my tape and I brought my guitar I played some songs there for him we listened to the tape and he was very nice very nice guy uh, and then uh, he said well you know I gotta tell you something you know he, 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 your songs and everything is fantastic your voice everything but but it always seems that you know you're going well with the song and suddenly boom you hit the wrong note you hit like a wrong chord you know (laughs) it was so funny you know and I said well I know that probably this will result in that we're not going to work together but I want to tell you that I take this as a compliment because I am looking for that wrong note that wrong chord that that thing that will you know provoke uh, some type of inflection you know uh, in the 
in, in, in the piece. Uh, cuts the scene. Sure enough, I mean, nothing happened, okay? Right, cuts the scene. 35 years later or something, where there's a tribute to Neil Young that uh, the Academy Grammys uh, put together and stuff. Uh, he uh, handles the publishing of Tom Waits and with the group, band, the band that, my band, Bajo Fondo, uh, we, we collaborate with diff different people. We have recorded with different uh, artists from different, Elvis Costello, for example, you know, La Mala Rodriguez, different people. So we wanted to do something with Tom Waits and Safa, we reached this guy, uh, uh, you know, through some other people, right? So he knew about me, this Gustavo, the guy that wanted this in Barajofono, and he knew about the guy, the Gustavo, that won the Oscars, right? So somebody introduced me to him. So this is me, oh, this is, you know, this is, and he goes, oh, yeah, you're the, the guy from the Oscars. I said, no, 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 I said, you don't remember, but you, I met you many, many years ago. And, you know, you were working here, you were doing, the guy was like, no, couldn't believe it, couldn't recognize me or whatever. And then I said, and you said something that I always mentioned to my friends or people when I talk, you said, you know, that all my music was, was going great and suddenly I hit a wrong note, a wrong chord, you know? And I said, you know, I kept on doing that. I always keep on searching for that note. And, but now people seems to like it. People seems to, to, to like the thing. Yes. He loved it, you know, because I never resent the guy. As a matter of fact, he was the only guy that paid attention to me. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And it became it's almost so like, yeah, like, yeah, like a life yeah, mission, yeah, like yeah, yeah. searching so that wrong great note. moment. Yeah. And actually after the thing, he came, especially with his wife. He wanted me, he was, he wanted his wife to meet me, you know? And he was said, you know, he couldn't stop talking about this all night, you know, because I can think also the guy said, you know, I had this guy who could have signed this guy, you know, and I let him, another guy won two Oscars and I don't know, it was, it was a great thing. And I'm, and uh, I remember Anne Hathaway because I did the music for Brokeback, like, like I mentioned to you prior to the movie being filmed. So, uh, and it was totally, you know, his genius, you know, that, that Anne that said, okay, we're going to put this here. We're going to put this here. We're going to repeat this. That's all his vision, you know, really, you know? Uh, so I remember, so he played the music to the actors. He used to listen to the music, uh, you know, then the morning before shooting and stuff. The music became an intricate part of the, of the thing. And he was so kind to mention in the LA yeah. Times that actually he put together the narrative of the, the movie through the music. Yeah, and I agree with that because I think that for me, the first movie I ever, I'm not a musician, but I, the way I got into filmmaking uh -huh. was music. And the first movie I ever saw that my, my mother ever showed me was Fantasia. And that's just image and music, you know? So right. I really think music fuels imagery. And then of course, for your job, when you look at the image, it, it brings out music from you. But I think there's a, a perfect cycle there. But, but, but one of the interesting things about the way I like to work better is without looking at any images. The images are in right. my mind. Was, I like to work from the script very mm. much and from talks with the director. Yes. And it's in that, from that, talking to the director and, you know, my understanding of the script and the characters and the vision of the director that I kind of like get, I, it, it gets me more inspired. That of course, then I work with him too. And if I have to score something to picture, I can do it too. But the way that the <clears throat> the themes come, you know, out and the the, the 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 fabric, the sonic, the idea of the instrumentation or this and that, it comes really more from the from the story, the characters, than actually looking at a at an image, you know. Right. So we're, yeah, we're. Good. Prior, Sorry. it worked great for the Last of Us because in the video game, as you know, you know, you, you don't get the final thing at the until the very, very end. Right. So you you have to. And in in the game, I mean, Neil has told me that because I was always giving, uh, I was delivering, you know, batches of of music every now and then. You know, it's a process of two three years, and uh, and he has written, uh, uh, he wrote scenes, uh, add scenes to the to the game and stuff based on pieces of music that he heard and go oh you know he, he imagines something out of that and and then you know yeah so yeah i mean you mentioned that the process of of just uh talking to directors or, or or having but not looking at the image yet so i'm curious where does that first note come from usually is it do you have to sit alone with your thoughts you just noodle a little bit and and or are you 
what are you latching onto from the director? Or what are you latching onto that really inspires you to start creating that first note? It's hard to, I, that, that, I don't know if I can answer. I, I don't know what is exactly. It's a combination of all the elements and suddenly something, something comes to my mind. It's like, for example, for, for Babel, I wanted an instrument that could be uh, like a kind of a, that could uh, tie these stories. And I knew that, you know, that I didn't, I wanted to be world, kind of world music, but not necessarily like a documentary, like a National Geographic documentary, you know, that you go to this or you hear them in the bar. So the, the oud was perfect because uh, the oud is the ancestors, ancestor of the lute, therefore the ancestor of the guitar so but you know the, so the lute connect me with the arabic world but also could connect me with the the mexican you know border with and i find it also that i could connect it with the sound of the koto to that string thing and the fact that i'm not a lute player which is something that i like and i stretch and i used to I like to talk about this thing sometimes that i I like to play instruments that I don't know how to play. I like to put myself in front of an instrument that it's not my instrument, you know, uh, because it uh, because force me to be minimalistic. Yes. Force me, you know, I can yeah. <laughs> put me in a situation of danger, which is right. that energy, you know, and of innocence too. It has a playful yes. element to it, you know. So right. the oud became a, you know, my my sort of my 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 helper, you know. Although in some cues, perhaps at the end, the oud wasn't featured, but it was the element, the thing that I I, I grab for that score, you know. Always always using my my run rock or guitars or that because that's also my 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 my, my the things that I play, you know. But uh, but uh, I I um. Sometimes it can be an instrument, you know, or or or, or a timber, like you, or 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 a, a quality. And for example, for the the this the um, Brokeback Mountain, you know, thing. What I was telling you, with Anne, when I met Anne Hathaway, she said, uh, talking about the theme, the 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 ta ta da da ta da ta da. The, the change when it goes ta ta da 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 ta ta da. You know, there's there's that really that that wrong note is there. You know, there's a wrong note there, and she said when I heard that dissonant thing, I went, oh man, and I said, great. I mean, she got it. You know that yeah that, that yeah twisted thing. Uh, for me, the same thing happened with the banjo in the second uh, installment of of the Last of Us because I wanted to continue exploring and expanding this concept of Americana uh, that had that, that, that guitar with, with a vibrato, that Western thing that you were talking about. Uh, he, and I always been attracted to the banjo. Uh, and I, of course, I didn't want to play it like a banjo. I'm not a banjo player, you know? And I knew that it was not going to sound like a banjo player playing it. It was going to sound different, but it will have those timbers that somehow will connect with that and that's what i what i like i like that combination that that uh, and to break a little bit of that and with all the respect to you know to 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 people you know I, it's funny because one day i did a talk in nashville and uh in the audience and i had my own rock on i was so glad that i played i played iwasu and uh in the audience was bella fleck and he came after you know to talk to me and said i i wanted to know how do you pick that the way I pick uh, Iwasu which is you know well four fingers sometimes three but four and he wanted to because he said we we pick with three fingers and he was so curious about how did I get that little that flowing thing that you know sounds like a continuum sounds like several yeah, it just keeps going and over yeah. But, yeah but it's really one you know right yeah it's one of my sort of trademarks you know yes and, yes and uh, and it's one of those things that still no one could <laughs> no one can do it i mean i hear things that are trying to trying to yeah <laughs> but it has it's this special flow yes it has to that has that thing uh, and uh so i mean i have tremendous respect for or or hansa eldin a wood player those are you know so what i do is it's a different thing it's more like a like a like a vision of an artist i feel like as an artist you give me a glass, I should be able to make music with it. I should be able to do, do something with it musical. 
you know. Yeah, find the, the, the spirit of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier than than others, but but I, I love and as a matter of fact, I, I do a, a for example, I use a lot uh, one of the things that is part of also of my trademark are PVC pipes, you know, hmm. construction pipes. I've yes. been playing those for years and I use them in my scores and, and in many, many, many things. Uh, and and I have this, this whole thing about found objects that, that I played. Not, so they're not actually instruments that I build. They're not built. There's no building involved. It's just an object found that produces a sound. You know, and that somehow right. you know the, this this Indian uh, tradition that that you know the things have spirits, the objects yes. have spirits. So when you, for me, when you pr produce a sound out of something, somehow it's like you know bringing out the spirit of that that object. Absolutely, it can be a bowl, it can be you know a bottle, it can be you know a, a, a pipe, a hard hard surface, ho hollow surface, yeah, exactly. all these different things. And uh, so I love the way. Uh, I mean, Last of Us scores, they have some melodic material and thematic material, but of course the thematic and I mean the dissonant and atmospheric stuff that you do so well, the minimal things. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, how do you, how did you evolve, what, in your mind, how did the two scores di differ from the second one to the first one? The, the first one was very focused on Joel and Ellie, that kind of bond and that, and of course both uh, games deal with all these moral ambiguities and ethics and, and all these, you know, right. kind of humankind kind of deteriorating without law and order. Second movie is revenge and, and of course, spoiler alert, uh, hopefully people have played the game by now, but subverting expectations. And we're all of a sudden, right. we're now with Abby for the rest of the game. Correct. And like, who's the bad that guy now? The, the interesting thing about bringing other instruments to the mix too, you know, mm -hmm. but instruments that continue sort of in the, in the, in the uh, emotional landscape that the first ones, but, and I, I, I have, for example, I replace, I use quite a bit in the first one, uh, a six string bass, a Fender six string bass, which is an old instrument. It's not this new modern bass with, you know, 24 strings. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's the old six string, which, which is actually like a guitar, but an octave lower, you know? Uh, and I use that uh, in the first one. In the second one, I found this this uh, guys in Argentina that became very good friends that are are string makers, and they made these strings for for a, a nylon string guitar, which is my first guitar, you know, uh, that are an octave lower. It's very it's the only manufacturer that I know. It's called Magma that do this strings. They, they, they are not, we can't find them anywhere else, you know? And so I have now a guitar that is, you know, like a nylon string, but it's an octave lower. It's exactly like that Fender bass, but, but in a nylon string. And I brought that and it's, it, it's also pretty feature in the, in the game too. And the addition of the banjo. I mean, all those things for me somehow, uh, Continuing with using, you know, the guitar, you know, and everything that I used uh, in the in the previous one, it uh, uh, helped creating this more uh, rich world of more characters. In that sense, you know, more 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 sounds, more elements, more timbers, <clears throat> and you can connect. I always felt that the Ron Rocco was uh, connected to Ellie. I always felt it because the Ron Rocco has that that delicate thing, you know, that 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 element that I, I associated with also uh, her, you know, especially in the first game, you know, her innocence and, you know, her, you know, like a fr fragility to her character at the correct, start correct. of it. And she goes through that journey to kind of become correct. hardened, but yeah. Right. So I, I continue with that. And then really it's not that, you know, the instruments are in, in the, in the case of the Ronroco with Ellie, yes, it's like that. But uh, in the case of Abby or in the case of Joe, it's not that necessary I found an instrument related to them. And the, in the case of the Ron Rocco and, and Ellie, yes. But the other is more just, you know, the, 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 the overall emotional landscape. Yes, and uh, so when people ask me, like, when I remember when the first game first came out, and it, of course it kind of grew very quickly and became, but I, I was, you know, I jumped on board, played it the first, and people were asking me about the score and everything. Sometimes, you know, my friends were like, oh, what's the score like? And when I, the way I would describe it, mm -hmm. and I'm curious how you would describe your own score, is I would always tell them it's like a, a candle that's just about to flicker out, but it's it's holding strong, and it's just about to go out. I, it's oh, just it. like it's it's staying there and it's staying there. Oh, it. 
Is, Love it. Yeah. Beautiful. Is that yeah. it? Because I'm, that, that's what it feels like to me. So I'm curious what your how you would describe your your own scores for those games. It's a great, great way because I I use that also in the composition. I love that. As a matter of fact, yeah, last night I was working on a piece that has that. You know, like um, I'm terrible with the titles. Terrible with titles. You know, so I I, I want to tell you about this piece that is in the Last of Us. That just waits and holds there. You know, and and it's that the image that you said is perfect because it's, it's about to go and then kind of like gets up again you know like in the candles you know oh yeah it's it alive. grows a little so, bit you know? still it's still there's still life there there's it's it's almost gone but it's there that light is still there yeah and i and i, I like sort of like those those thing of waiting you know and that and that those silence they, they, they you know explore the the silence and the, the 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 eloquent silence you know the silence that 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 talk i always say that that they, in a way sometimes it's easier to to play i mean you know if you if you you know play fast and people are so into you know playing fast and stuff and i mean if you practice you practice you can play i mean but to not play that that's that's hard you know yeah to, to reserve yourself and hold yourself back yeah, yeah. reservation yeah just to, to, and that's a big job of composers to know when to to stay quiet so you don't interrupt or you don't ruin the, mo the moment yeah correct and i'm i'm not a big fan of of uh, movies uh, i mean I, I enjoy all kinds of movies and I, I mean for me i don't like very much when it's music 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 yeah wall to wall 10 minutes uh, it becomes almost like irrelevant the music or, or it works in enough in another way it's a different thing like in animation you know it really i mean it, it just goes hand in hand it's almost like a you know so it's a different totally different thing but in a dramatic movie in a normal movie and stuff it uh, i i i like the the, the 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 economic way of using music you know just when it when it's needed to support not to to you know to to become and, and in documentaries, especially, you know, when you see something that is horrible, you know, that is happening, you know, in the, you know, some, you know, famine in the world and stuff, and you put music to it, it in a way, I mean, it becomes, it, it trivializes, you know? Yes, it, because, yeah, it's <clears throat> your, yeah, it kind of uh, takes away the authenticity or something, because it's the illusion of reality, what the music is doing, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, you and know? the music sort of tells you how you have to feel, you know? Yeah. I mean, of course, art is always manipulative, in a way, you know, sure. but, but like good magicians, I think, you know, you don't have to, you, like, you enjoy a magician when you don't, you don't know how they did it, right? And you, you don't want to feel that you are manipulated. You just want to feel that you know, things are happening and, and that, you know, suddenly something magical happened. Yes. But, you know, <laughs> you are being manipulated. That's, you know. Right. Sometimes you want to, sometimes you want to, I remember growing up, I would be like, I'm, if I'm feeling sad or something and I wanted to maybe feel a little bit different or something. I knew a piece of music I could go to to help me exactly. get to that emotion. Or maybe I want to accentuate my sadness and make myself cry. And then you just but pile it you, on. You are manipulating yourself. Yes. You know, yeah. I'm going to do this to myself. Okay. Right. When Absolutely. somebody else does it to you, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, that's different. Yeah, completely different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, I did want to mention also, before, you know, before as we kind of wrap up a little bit, uh, you did another great series, Monsterland, for Hulu, the Hulu original. And I, I so noticed much. a lot of... Thank you. Thank you so much, because nobody really, uh, right, not nobody, but not lots of people actually uh, knew about it or knows about it. And for me, it was a great thing to explore that type of genre, you know? Yes. And uh, it was based on a, a series of short stories of kind of North American monster stories. And yes. and it's an anthology. Each episode is kind of a little story right. taking place there in a different some, there city. There were some that were truly, for, for me, fantastic. I mean, it wasn't all even, you know, uh, but but it's a great, great series. And some of them were truly fantastic. I think like the first episode and the third one, and they're really great. Yeah. You know? And it really highlighted your kind of, a, if you love Last of Us, anybody listening, if you love the dissonance <laughs> and the atmospheric and what Gustavo does with that, it's it's mm, beautiful. <laughs> you really, I mean, it just warps with your mind and then you just, you're, it yeah. grabs you. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, so yeah, definitely check it out. It's Hulu, uh, Hulu original for sure. Um, so just kind of to wrap up, what what, if you had to 
say, what's the most challenging aspect of your job? What would you say is the most challenging aspect of your job? Most challenging aspect. I find it very challenging, uh, you know, all, all the stuff that has to do with spotting and uh, uh, that is, is always, uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I like to rely a lot also in, in, in the directors and, and, and the editors in that thing and not so much be... It seems like you're, you, you feel constricted by the picture sometimes, right? Is that right. Am I correct with okay. that? Yeah. So that's part, you know, of the, of, of, of the challenge because, I mean, the, the, my uh, lack of academic tuition hasn't been really a problem you know even when i have to work with strings or things like that and stuff i do i put down all my ideas and then i always try to bring somebody you know as great as david campbell to you know to to you know arrange and orchestrate and who, who actually you know is respects a lot of you know what i want to do but just you know <clears throat> or tim davis who's you know did book of life and and uh, eh, but uh, I will say that that uh, spotting perhaps is one of the things that is a little bit uh, hard to challenging. When sometimes it's really obvious, oh no, we go. But it's the the ones that are not so obvious that sometimes you go, oh, gee, you know, it's cool that they put music here because I wouldn't have, you know, I, I yeah, I would yeah. use much less music always. Yeah, you'd always probably pull always back less music. Yeah, <laughs> and then. Cool. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And then to, to the last question, I want to say, what's the most rewarding aspect? What is the most fulfilling, creatively fulfilling aspect of your job that you love at the end of every project that completely makes it worth it? To be honest, I, I like what really rewards me is the reaction of the, 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 the people, you know, like, for example, that uh, in a way, I mean, I, I do feel that that uh, is a gift this because I don't know where it comes from you know what I mean I, of course I work very hard I, I am the one that believes that you know it's 80 percent of you know pers trans perspiration and 20 percent of inspiration I do believe in that and uh, looking for your own you know your own voice your own identity stay truthful to that all, all that stuff uh, but it's when but I, I, all that you know it, it has a purpose I mean when I think I mean why do I do what I do in every aspect, you know, doing music for movies, uh, doing uh, 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 writing songs, producing other artists, somehow is to affect people in a positive way. That's what I what I really would like to to do. And when I when I feel that that hap happens, uh, it, it's tremendously rewarding. You know, my my dad, who was a great 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 man, and uh, which I lost when I was a kid, but you know, still got me the opportunity to tell me some really great advice in many things and uh, so one day I, I you know confronted him and said you know but what would you like me to be when I grow up you know and, and my dad was always no I would like to do whatever you want to be whatever you know whatever never do anything that doesn't make you happy that was one of the things that he always told me never do anything that doesn't make you happy but once pushed pushed he said well I mean perhaps or either a, a doctor, a medical doctor, or a priest, he said, you know. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, I was going to be, I wanted to be a priest when I was a kid. It, it's so, uh, what I feel that what I do in a way has a little bit of both things, you know, has like a thera therapeutic uh, quality <clears throat> too, you know, and it has a spiritual uh, 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 value too. You know, and uh, so I went to Kuwait, when was it, uh, a couple of years ago, right before all this, uh, for a video conference and stuff. And it was so incredible to be in Kuwait with, you know, women totally covered, you know, that are gamers, that are gamers. Can you wow. imagine? I mean, you know, I can, amazing. I can imagine only what that, that is for them. It's like totally the, 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 the place that they can be a little bit free, you know, playing that game, you know, but... And when you see the, the 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 impact that the music has had on those on the people, you know what I mean. That's what is the most rewarding thing for me is is seeing that what that I have done something that had made people uh, feel good, you know what I mean, or feel an emotion, or or have moved them, you know, or entertained them, or you know that has been useful. That I have done something that is being useful, you know.
Yes. And it, it has for me and I think it has for so many people. And and it's just it's also it just shines a light on the beauty of music itself and the music, the beauty of storytelling, connecting humans and, and cultures, different no language barriers, no you know, borders. Everything is just human and emotion. And I think that's the beauty of it. For sure. The music has that that wonderful, wonderful element, you know, in in, in it. And uh, so that's that's what I really truly celebrate. Yes. And uh, absolutely. No, and Gustavo, I wanted to thank you for your time. I know you have a, a you know you have a, a busy schedule ahead of you, and it's been so great to talk to you. And I honestly could probably talk to you for another three hours. Thank, but... you, thank you so much. I'm sorry if I could, perhaps you know. Say... Oh no, I, I loved hearing everything. And oh, I forgot to mention, I, I definitely caught your cameo in Last of Us Part Two. You sitting ah, with the banjo. That's that's amazing. That's I literally, amazing. I was walking. I was like. Is that Gustavo? And I walk over. <laughs> He's, you know, you're sitting with the well, banjo. Imagine for me to keep that. I couldn't tell anybody. My wife knew about it, but my son, I couldn't tell my son. I knew if I told my son, he wasn't <laughs> going to be able to keep it for himself. So, so you know, I knew it for for a year. Almost. Yeah, and, you know, I know you had to get they, they had to design your character model and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, all right, Gustavo, thank you so much uh, well, for your time. Thank, thank been... you, thank you, Guy, and, and anytime, anything. anything.